notes on a new theory of the concept of gameplay, and it's up to you guys to decide if there's any newness in this approach of novelty. At least I would say before I start that um, I was thinking about getting older because I actually wrote a piece in 2003 or 2004, I think, uh, playing and gaming or gaming and playing blah blah blah, trying to figure out what the difference is and how they blend together and especially trying to answer this uh, obnoxious question of what is gameplay and here I go 15 years later so either I'm just standing still or the earth is really rotating fast so and let me just say also uh, as an excuse or whatever that you, the, 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 the minute, uh, the painstakingly minute details of the argumentation is of course in the paper, the conference paper, but also uh, including a quite um, massive review on the literature of gameplay, things that have been said about trying to clarify what is this concept is part of an article written by me and Les Juhl Larsen, a colleague of mine at University of Southern Denmark, forthcoming in Games and Culture. So, why the hassle, why the puzzle? Well, um, it's because that if you were a true philosopher, how would you go about dealing with this concept, the concept of gameplay? If you look at play and game or gaming, it's something that is, and that would require some sort of ontological understanding, at least in the post-Kantian sense. But it's also, and that is of course the, 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 the hard question, it's also something that we do, uh, which would require some sort of epistemology. What is it then? And so uh, the division between a system and an activity, something that is there and it's fixated, sort of, and something on the other hand that keeps on going and you can't really nail it. And I think that is also why Ludology 1.0, or whatever we call it, uh, it was so occupied with certain forms of formalism uh, in the ontological studies of games, for instance, and I think first and foremost, the investigation of game rules, which are exactly categorical uh, structures or means for structurization that somehow explain the dynamic progression, which is the activity of actually playing a game. It's like formalism tries to bridge the division between system and activity. And to figure out what gameplay is, I was thinking about this one. And that is obviously a rhetorical question, because this is not fun at all. It's not fun having a blue square on a presentation. Well, it could be fun if I was going to be very awkward and serious about that. Now I'm going to explain the blue square for you, then it might become fun or awkward. But my idea is that once you do that, you get Counter-Strike, in a sense. Now this is lots of fun. It's not lots of fun having a, 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 a red marker inside a blue square, but I think the indication and the, this sudden appearance of the red thing in the empty blue square points, briefly speaking, to activity. Now we have something uh, standing for activity, we have a sense of direction, you have to avoid the, the red thing and if there's a door or maybe there's a helicopter waiting and ah, so now we can escort the VIP in a certain direction. Uh, it installs a certain logic and a dynamic ensuring a purpose. Ah, I have to avoid the other team lurking behind the red uh, thing in the blue square. And it gives you a, the player a hint of, or perhaps a desire for reward. Uh, or as Jesper Juhl would say in Utology 1.0, in formalism, a quantifiable outcome. Thank God there was this red thing in the blue square. So in short, is the installment of meaning and significance. And without meaning and significance, basically without 
the red thing in the blue square, there wouldn't be any gameplay and there wouldn't be any need for answering why is this so goddamn important. And there's a lot of things written about gameplay and I think there's a lot of different things written about gameplay. But, to cut a long story short, and there I invite you to consult the paper because there's the rich argumentation, of course. Uh, it's a postulate, but I think it, it's there. I would say that gaming is very much about progression, and play or playing is very much about desiring to be inside presence, the sensation of presence. And that points to something I think Gadamer also spoke about, the tone fro movement of playing a game, which can be translated, I think, into a here and a there. So gameplay is the activity that we try to formalize, that we try to make stand still so that we can see it analytically. But it's actually a dynamic, non-equilibrium movement between a here, which is play, the installment or appropriation of a certain place in an environment, so here play happens, but once you get inside that and you've set your sense, you're feeling this presence, you want to move on. And that is the evolutionary logic of play, that it's always in danger of turning into gaming. And suddenly you have structurization, and rules, termination, a logic, and eventually a quantifiable outcome. So the presence of play comes from the appropriation of place. Miguel Sicar has written about that quite beautifully. And the constitution of a here. And that is very much what Gadamer says back in the old days. Whereas the game or gaming activity takes place in this here, obviously, a magic circle, some would call it. But furthermore, and importantly, focuses on the there. This is where I'm going to. This is level four. I'm at level three. It's an enjoyable space, but I'm kind of bored. So show me my inventory, and I want to progress to level four. And that's the nerve behind gaming and the activity of gaming. To put it even more shortly, and in order to fall the way for a modeling, of, a formalistic modeling of this activity of gameplay, here is play, and then the game moves towards a there. And this is exactly, plus minus all the argumentation, this is exactly where I think Heidegger steps into the picture. Obviously, taking into the consideration that Heidegger was not actually interested in solving the gameplay conceptualization mystery. But once I actually spoke to a bunch of, you know, employed philosophers about that, and I, I, I sort of said provocatively, Heidegger was really a game theoretician, and he was the founder of ludology and all that, and they, 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 they really didn't laugh, because they actually thought that the concept of Dasein, which I'm going to speak about, which is embedded in Sein und Zeit, I think it's from 1929 or something, is really game theory disguised as philosophy. So there's actually a point. He was, in a way, talking and, and thinking about playing and gaming when he wrote about Dasein. The thing about Dasein and the thing about the dynamic shifting of place between gaming, looking for progression, and playing, desiring presence, back and forth, toe and fro, in comes Gautama, is the shifting of accentuation, not rhetorically, but analytically, between Dasein, and I have to overemphasize it, I hope you, you catch my drift, Dasein, and Dasein. If, when, you, when and if you shift the accentuation, you get a difference between playing, which is all about sign, which is all about being, which is all about feeling the sensation of being. Here I am. Here is the prolongation of my essentiality or something like that. And this is where I want to go. I don't want to go 
at an unspecified place, but I want to go exactly down to do because you constitute 80 points, and once I get 20 points back at Essen, I get 100 points, and then quantifiable oh, outcome. I'm not a seven in a group of eight or something like that. Okay, so da sign and da sign. And we thought about that. Lesson was very good at reviewing all the literature and trying to carve out this really complex picture. I'm not good at that, but I thought about this Heidegger thing, and out of that comes a number of models, ways to look at how to implement the Heidegger thing into the desire to clarify and understand the nature of gameplay, which I think is equally um, problematic as the concept of time. You know, Augustine said that time, well, we perfectly understand what it is, but once we have to scrutinize it and bring it into a, a formula or a, a certain logic or something, something that's up there on the cover, well, we're not so sure. So, you know, three different models or ways of looking at it. It's like leveling the, uh, the, 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 the puzzle. On one level, you have the analytical level. Of course, you could put game on this side, play on this side, and say, oh, well, okay, although they, come some, they, they are somehow convoluted or they, they, they intermingle or whatever, you can, you can put some attributes to, to game and likewise on play. Uh, which may become messy because then you read a book about play and you think to yourself, well, this is really a book about gaming. Uh, for instance, when people talk about the rules of play, I would say they are really talking about gaming, or at least they are talking about that specific element within play that has this kind of evolutionary progression towards gaming. Okay, so that's one level. On a experience level or phenomenological level, which is, would you could call it an epistemic level. Heidegger would call it that. You, you, you just have gameplay. You're just there. You're just playing. And that is part of the confusion because really, when you read about it, 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 it it's, it's like gameplay is really just playing a game. It's like a synonym for playing a game. It's simply just the activity of playing a game. Like reading or uh, investigation or making love or something like that. So things get messy, but in order to clarify how, to what extent they get messy, the third figure might come in, because there seems to be a sort of desirable non-balance, a non-equilibrium between a game mode, where you're really considering the next progression. Ah, I definitely have to find this update in order to go to level 5 rather than level 4. And, of course, asking yourself the question, perhaps subconsciously, why am I even bothering to locate this item to get me to level 5? Well, it's because it's quite enjoyable on an existential level to be and to feel the presence. So, basically, the activity of gameplay, analytically speaking, putting it into a model, would be the constant oscillation, toe and fro, between a here, am I playing, and there, my gaming dictates me to go back and forth, game mode, play mode, game mode, play mode. And I was wondering, if you play a game, actually, in the living room, there's the here, okay, here's my tennis catcher, and there's the game, it's installed in my living room, and I go out to take a cup of coffee, so is the cup of coffee part of the game? Is it here or is it there? In any case, I'm tossing back and forth between game mode and play mode. So, the way we would analyze it is an analytical model, something that you can put up there. A division between gaming and playing, Da, da sign and da sign. But if you want to have a frozen picture, 
which is basically an unrealistic picture, but because in real time, when gameplay happens, it escalates and, 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 and so on. So that is this model. You can talk about different instances or perceptions of here, here I am, I am playing and I'm enjoying the existential freedom and enjoyment or displacement of being a cowboy or an assassin or whatever, and I want to go there. So there are different displacements of there and here, or here and there, within the flow of gameplay. And basically, I think these uh, notes represent a collection of desires to understand the nature of gameplay rather than being sort of a fixed outcome or the conclusion to an empirical survey of different instances. So philosophers would call that prologonema to understanding something. That is what I hope to have provided. Whether the nature of gameplay is more lucid than before, I don't know. Nevertheless, it continues to be a very interesting but also very puzzling concept. But I think that Heidegger and the concept of Dasein might take us just a step further. Thank you. something I'm interested recently. I am currently reading a recent book by Brian Hutton, Situational Game Design. And his approach to the problem of gamefulness versus playfulness is in the concept of interpretive play. He claimed to do away with this dichotomy of game and narrative and play by the scene. Playfulness or the act of playing with uh, game choices uh, on equal level with playfulness with the narrative layer of the game. You can interpret information and imagine things. So I tend to be radical anti dichotomist. So whenever someone presents me with a dichotomy like that, there is game, there is play, I tend to look for a third option in between yeah. to prove that these two uh, opposites are not really. So much different. So it leads me to the question. It's a question. Yeah. Uh, so we can define gamefulness as orientation towards there, mm -hmm. and playfulness as orientation on the here. Mm -hmm. How would you explain the fun, the playfulness we have with narration, with the story? It's not game-like, we don't have game rules, and yet narratives tend to be linear. So yes. it is at the same time, playfulness in the present, but is oriented, oriented towards the development of the plot to the future. How does it fit into your model? Uh. Maybe, maybe there's an analytical, maybe there's not a cognate, but maybe there's an analytical division between play and playfulness. Because when you think of narration or the sensation of at least following a, a, a thread or a linear movement that can be exciting and dynamic and you're reading a book or watching a movie and so on, maybe there's a playful progression going on. Maybe this playfulness is the first step in a series of small evolutionary steps from the, try to imagine that, which is also kind of a narrative, that there's a, there was a place or there was a time back in the days, <laughs> you know, when there was just an open field of endless possibilities. It's like looking at the back garden. What am I going to do? It's just a means for pleasure. It's something to enjoy, I think. But once I start to explore, I and mankind, evolutionarily speaking, uh, sets out a course. A course that involves some sort of structurization, a course that also eventually produce rules that produces 
hooks in order to get you going and provide you with a sense of direction. And perhaps this enjoyment coupled with the structurization is playful. And I think that is the reason why it's so difficult and yet analytically challenging to consider play, playfulness as a kind of motor or d dynamo, an engine principle for progression that then becomes a game. It's not like in, in real life, cognitively speaking, that we have a sharp division and idea self-consciously what play is and what gaming is. Rather, I think there are oscillatory small steps that you might, I'm saying might, test empirically. And this is sort of the theory behind it. Can you come up or can you pinpoint these uh, sensation of displacement? Now I feel like I'm gaming. Now I feel like I'm playing. Now I have this idea of being here in play. And now I have this desire towards going there, game mode, and so on. And I don't think there's any difference between playfully following the thread, the path, the linearity of a novel or watching a movie or enjoying the gameplay activity.